decreasing interval setup. So now we're about to look for concavity. So how do we do concavity? Pretty much the same way. We're going to look for concave up first. So I want to know when is the second derivative greater than zero. So concave up when f double prime is greater than zero. Somewhere we computed the second derivative. There we go, 12x squared minus 24x. So I'm going to demonstrate some bad moves to make here. So you might think, ah, well, uh, I can certainly multiply by a 12th and get x squared minus 2x greater than 0. Remember, I multiplied by positive 1 12th to get down to here. So that's a completely reasonable thing to do. And in fact, it's, I think, a very smart thing to do. So let me show you a bad move to make. What did I assume and not write down? I'm OK on that step. I added 2x to both sides. That's not going to flip my inequality. So well, did I take a square root? What did I do to go from this step to the next step? I divided by x. So first of all, I'm assuming x is not 0. What else am I assuming? x is positive. I did. How, how do you know I assumed x is positive? Because I didn't change my sign around, so I assume whatever I divide or multiply by is positive. So if I actually do this, there's two possible outcomes, and that depends on whether or not x is positive or negative. So now I have to also keep track. There's another condition that I have to keep track of as well. So this gets complicated. I don't recommend that you try to solve it this way. This is a bad way to do an inequality. This step is OK here. I haven't multiplied by anything that could be negative. I haven't multiplied any, by anything other than that 1 12th. But I'm going to actually go back to the previous step. So how do we graph an inequality? Or how do we f solve an inequality we graph? So I'm going to graph this right here. This is an easy function to graph. We factor out an x pretty easily. Remembering, factoring is not the same as multiplying both sides. I did not mess around on the right side at all. I just changed the form on the left. So let's give this function a name. Oh, we have a name for it. Well, technically it's 1 12th f double prime. So I can graph this pretty easily. X intercepts are 0 and 2. That's why I factored it. We got 0, we have 2. What will the graph look like? What's the basic shape of this graph? Parabola. Happy or sad? Happy. I could figure out the vertex. Not really necessary though. It's a happy parabola so it's going to graph like this right here. So I don't know exactly how, uh, what the actual y value minimum is, but if I needed to, I could figure it out. It doesn't matter. And for us, I just want to know when is it negative, when is it positive. So it's going to be positive basically outside of 0, 2, and it's going to be negative between 0 and 2. If I was doing a sine graph, I would plug in probably negative 1, 1, and 3. That would be the three easiest values I could think of. And then I would get plus here, minus in the middle, plus over here. You could go crossing and bouncing. If you know what your function looks like, these are both cross intercepts. So you can use that knowledge as well. OK, so our given was the x-intercepts. So which x-intercepts were we given originally? We were given a 1.6. But of, of which function, though? So we will use, when we actually get to the graph, we, those are x-intercepts on the actual graph of f. 
All we're doing now is figuring out what does f double prime look like. Uh, okay, so we're going to be graphing the original function? That's like the last thing we do, basically. So we'll definitely use those when we go to graph our function at the end. So I have increasing uh, in this negative infinity to 0, so right here, and increasing from 2 to infinity. Oh, I said the wrong word, not increasing, concave up. We're looking at our second derivative. So we're concave up, negative infinity to 0, union 2 to infinity, concave down from 0 to 2. And concave up is smiley face, concave down, frowny face. So that's concave up, concave down. So we are almost finished with this. Uh, I didn't have any vertical asymptotes. Our next example, we're going to have vertical asymptotes. And vertical asymptotes have a similar properly, property to x-intercepts, meaning you can be positive on one side of the vertical asymptote. You might be positive or negative on the other side. So it may go from being positive to negative, or it might go positive, positive, very much like an x-intercept. So here we have uh, f double prime is less than 0 between 0 and 2. Oh, okay. And then here we have f double prime greater. That's what the negative and the positive meant. So it meant. doesn't have anything to actually do with the curve going up and down? Like it kind of does. So if I want to know about how the second derivative was changing, then I could, that would basically be information about the third derivative. Or I could go back up here. If I actually figured out this point, uh, I could say that the function is, let's see, concave down. No, I don't want to. I'll talk about decreasing. So this function is decreasing 0 to 2. Or, whoa, negative infinity to 0, right? This, this function, f prime, is decreasing 0 to 2. Or not 0 to 2. Why am I saying 0 to 2? All right. So you, this is a graph of f prime. f prime is decreasing up to 0. Correct? What does that mean about f double prime? f prime is decreasing, so f double prime is negative. Oh my gosh. f prime is not decreasing. f prime is increasing. <laughs> it's increasing. It's going up to the right. Don't look at the arrow. It's going to mess you up. It's going up to the right. <laughs> so f prime is increasing up to 0. And if we scroll down, we see that f double prime is positive from, zero, uh, from negative infinity to 0. I could have gotten some of this information off the graph here. Okay, so you just swap the signs once uh, No, the signs don't swap. It's, you can look at the increasing, decreasing of this graph, or you could look at the positive, negative of the derivative graph. One of the problems with looking at increasing, decreasing of this green graph, I have to figure out where the local minimum was. So I can go from decreasing to increasing in the right spot. I'd have to end up taking an, a derivative of this graph, setting equal to 0, and figuring out where is it going from decreasing to increasing. Basically doing the work that we did right here. I'm just separating it out. And if you're first derivative function is not uh, a nice, if it's got a few vertical asymptotes, it's going to be a lot harder to figure out exactly where is it increasing and decreasing. So our function was start out as a polynomial. We know a lot about polynomials, so I was able to sketch a graph pretty quickly. But if my, 
I recommend you don't use the slope of these graphs, that you use the y values. So we looked at, uh, so don't look at where this is increasing and decreasing. Just look positive and negative, and then draw your conclusions about increase and decreasing off the positive and negative of this graph. Okay. Don't worry about this derivative graph increasing. Go ahead and just graph the second derivative and worry about being positive and negative. So you can get some of this information here off of the increase and decrease in the previous graph. The only problem is you may not have the best graph above. The more conclusions you draw from your graph, the more accurate you need to make sure your graph is, basically. So we have concave up and concave down. So I'm going to take all this information and put it into one table. So 0 and 2 are x values that were important, also 3. So I'm going to pay attention to 0, 2, and 3 for my x values. So I'm going to make one big table. Zero, two, three. Is this number seven? I'm just summarizing f uh, five and six, basically, oh, okay. into one uh, big table. So f prime was, let's see, increasing three to infinity. So increasing 3 to infinity. And f prime was decreasing somewhere else, negative infinity to 0 and 0 to 3. So I'm just drawing down to the right, up to the right, depending on if we're increasing or decreasing. Now f double prime tells me about concavity. And I'm going to use 0 and 2 are the x values here. And we go concave down 0 to 2. So this is a frowny face. And then smiley face, smiley face for a concave up. So all I'm doing is taking the information we wrote down and basically drawing a visual representation. So we're finally ready for step 7, which is draw all the information on a graph that we have so far. And let me write down the proper name for it. Plot key stuff, I think, is what I wrote. So these are uh, x and y intercepts, crit points. We don't have any vertical asymptotes, but we did have some end behavior, so I'm just going to write asymptotes slash end behavior. I think I gave you some x values. We got negative 17 as our, I think, largest y value or smallest y value. And we go up to 10 or a little past 10. My y values are going to be just sort of approximated, and they're not going to be to scale too much. I'm making sure 17 looks bigger than 10, but obviously, if the scale is the same, 10 is where 2 should be, looking at the x scale. I just don't want to draw a really, really tall graph and try to, and then make my x's really, really narrow. So I'm just stretching the x-axis out a little bit. Looks like 17 is probably too far down, not super important. So let's plot our points. We had 0, 10. That was one point. Was that a local max or a local min or inflection? 
Inflection? Okay. I'm just going to write inflect right there. And then we had a minimum somewhere. Is that with? Three seven negative seventeen. Yeah. So that was a local minimum. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, I know that around that point, it's a local minimum. So around that point that I just true, I know the function is going to look something like that. I don't know what's going to happen after that, but I know really close to that point it's going to go up on both sides. That's what it means to be a local minimum. That's what it means to be concave up. So right around that point, it's going up on both sides. X-intercepts I gave you already. They were 1.6. So that'll be right about there. 1.6 and 3.8. Right about there. So those were our two given X-intercepts. And remember, we're graphing F now. We're not graphing derivatives. We're going to use that information, but we're graphing the original function. So we have a y-axis intercept already, happened to be an inflection point. That was just coincidence. And we got our two x-intercepts. We have our critical points. And now the only thing left, we have no asymptotes, but we do have end behavior. So we got right end and left end, and that was up on both sides. So just looking at the x values I've plotted, I could draw my end behavior over here, but there's really nothing happening for all these x values. So if I draw my end behavior this far to the right, it's further than it really needs to be. The last thing happening is an x-intercept right here at 3.8. So I can just go ahead and draw my end behavior going right off of that. That's the furthest x value to the right that I know anything about. If I had another x-intercept or another critical point or a vertical asymptote, I'd have to go to the right of that but this is the furthest thing to the right. Now, what is the furthest to the left or left end behavior? The furthest to the left is this y-intercept right here, the x equals zero point. And that's up on the left side as well. So right out of there, I can draw an arrow going up to the left. You don't necessarily want to draw it over here because then I'm going to have to connect it something like that. And we obviously don't have another critical point right there. So that's not the way the graph's going to look. So I'm going to the furthest left that I can and drawing off of that. Now we have to worry about the middle part right here. And this is where things get more complicated. We're going to use this table. So I've drawn every reference point we possibly can. All the intercepts, all the critical points, and behavior. Now it's down to, can you sketch the curve properly? And we're going to go left to right. You could start at any point and go any direction, but I'm just going to start all the way on the left and then work my way to the right. So I'm going to start at our inflection point here. So before we do that, to the left of 0, are we decreasing and concave up? Let's check that on our graph. Are we decreasing to the left of 0? Yes. We are. Don't look at the arrow is going to make you look the wrong way. So when I look to the right, we're going down. So that's decreasing. Now, concavity, there's not much concavity, but it is slightly tilted upwards. So there is a little bit of concavity there going upwards. So we got decreasing and concave up. So that's the two properties we needed. What would concave down look like? It would bend like this. What does zero concavity look like? It's not bending, i.e. going straight. So that's no concavity. So concave up means it bends upward. Concave down doesn't necessarily have to bend to be negative. It just has to bend downwards. All right, now we're going to go from 0, x zero, x equals 0 to x equals, let's see, I think our next thing is 2. So from 0 to 2 right in here, we're going to go decrease, concave down. So we're going to sketch a curve. It needs to be decreasing, concave down. And I have to hit any of the points that are already on the graph. So we're going 0 to 2. 0. I don't have a y value for 2. It would be reasonable to figure out what is f of 2. 
if you want to be extra accurate. So I don't have a y value for 2. I don't really feel like getting one right now. Let's go. We'll go 0 to this x-intercept. I need to go decreasing concave down. Yes. Now, I have a slight problem here. I think my slope is too high right here. What should my slope be at this inflection point? Zero. I did not draw what looked like a zero slope. That looked like negative 10 or something like that. So here's a zero slope. So I'm supposed to be going to the left, concave up, and decreasing. So it should look like this. It's going to come out horizontally and then go up. There we go. That's a little better. So I should be coming out of the right side horizontally and going downwards. So it's going to look like this. Going downwards, concave down. Now I keep decreasing and keeping the concavity going down until I hit x value of 2. So it's going to look like this. What changes when x becomes 2? What changes going across 2? Am I going to be decreasing the whole time? No. On both sides of 2? Yes. Yes. So what changes? Concavity. Goes from concave down to concave up. So this curve starts to bend upwards here. So whatever, I could figure out this y value if I want to. It's not terribly important. But what is important is we go from decreasing concave down to decreasing concave up. We're still decreasing, but we're going to be bending upwards now. And then we connect into our next point. So we're still going downhill, but we're starting to curve upwards. So our slope is getting less negative. Our slope is increasing. So what happens at 3? At 3, we keep concavity upwards, so we keep bending upwards. But we go from being decreasing to increasing. And of course, we know we're 0 at 3. So we go from being decreasing to increasing, but we keep bending upwards. So it's going to look like this. <coughs> so any questions going from 2 to 3? To get full credit, do we have to show that one big table? No. So this graph is basically complete. If I want to make it more accurate, technically, the way I drew it, there's some concave downwards happening right here. There's a little bit of bending downwards. So if I wanted to really draw an accurate graph, I need to keep increasing and concave up. So I need to have this curve go steeper and steeper and steeper like this. And then that would be more accurate. So how accurate is our graph? We're going to go and plot it. I don't know. They're probably the same. I think Desmos takes a second click to get to the graphing part. Desmos takes a second click to get to the graphing part, whereas Fooplot lets me type in immediately. I think Desmos has some extra features. So the scale is going to be very different. Same basic shape, 
I stretch my x-axis out quite a bit more. So if I go and make a custom window, like we go negative four to 10, and our y is negative 20 to 20. That might be more accurate to the scale that we used. So there's the foo plot graph, and here's our graph. They're pretty similar. In fact, they're actually right, almost right on top of each other. I don't know. I can't put them both up on the same time, but you can tell it's pretty good. This is just the f of x function, right? Not, not the, prime, the, the prime. Yeah, this is the regular function that I graphed. I could graph the other two, the derivative and the second derivative, but they're a little bit less interesting. They're basically a lower degree polynomial. And I have a pretty good graph right here. The only thing I didn't pay attention to was how steep the curves are. Yeah. So for example, this probably looks a bit more maybe like that. But I just used, I didn't use the steepness here. I just used the positive negative aspect. Do you want us to uh, graph just the f of x function, or do you want us to graph? So you don't have to graph f prime, but you do have to determine where is a positive, where is a negative. Okay. So you can either do a sine graph, or you can do a regular graph, a really fast graph. You could try algebra, but hopefully I've convinced you over the last year that doing algebra on uh, polynomial inequality is very dangerous. You're pretty much, you're probably three or four times more likely to get an uh, invalid answer here. Because you have to pay attention when you multiply or divide. And that's, it's a lot of bookkeeping to do that. It turns into more of a logical computer science type problem than a regular math problem. All right, so that's our polynomial graph. We, we are going to graph a, a rational function next. So one common problem that I see when students do this on their final or their quiz is that they get bogged down in the derivative and then the second derivative. So what I want you to do first, I know it's not step one, but I want you to find g prime and simplify it and then find g double prime. So find g prime and simplify it. Don't have some huge expression and then take a derivative of that. So simplify it as much as you can, and then take a derivative of the simple version. So you'll probably get something ugly originally. Multiply it all out, reduce all your combined like, like terms and all that. And once you have a simplified derivative, then go ahead and take a derivative of that for g double prime.
Are there any questions on the simplified G prime? So I think this is as simple as it's going to get for your next derivative. So take the derivative of this function here. Oh, I lost a squared on my x. That's pretty important. That'll change things. So second derivative questions. Be careful with your powers of x. x squared squared is x to the fourth power. Um, that product right there. Ah, same thing. <laughs> 16, so we got 16 fourths, that'll be 4. <coughs> so we're going to uh, do all the steps now. So we're going to get the domain, that's the first part. Remember, it's the domain of the original g. So what is the domain of the original g function? Yep, don't use 0. So negative infinity to 0, 0 to infinity. And asymptotes. Do we have vertical asymptote? Yeah. It looks like it, but we need to take a limit as x approaches 0 from one of the two sides and then show that that's positive or negative infinity. So it looks like it should be x equals 0 for a vertical, but I need to show using a limb. So we're going to approach 0. I recommend do the positive side. It's usually one less negative to worry about. And our original function, x squared plus 4 over 2x. So we're going to get 4 over 2 times positive 0. So we're going to get 4 over a tiny number. So that's going to be positive infinity here. So everything is positive. Positive 4 over positive 2 times a tiny positive number. So that's going to be a very big positive value. If I approached on the negative side instead of the positive side, I would have gotten negative infinity here. So if I approached on the left side, I would have gotten negative infinity. You don't need to write this down, but this gives us a little bit of information. This means at the x equals 0 vertical asymptote, if I approach on the right side, our graph will go towards positive infinity. So you don't need to write that down, but it's just something to keep in mind when we finally draw our graph. If I'm approaching on the right 
negative infinity, I have a problem. So this means we should approach positive infinity on the right side. All right, end behavior is next. So we're going to take two limits, x approaches infinity and x approaches negative infinity of this original function. Let's do positive infinity first. Because x is approaching positive infinity, does this plus 4 make much difference? Nope, you're going to have a huge number squared plus 4. So if you got a trillion squared plus 4, I don't care about the plus 4. So we're going to do the physicist method and ignore the plus 4. So what does this reduce to? Basically x over 2. And this is infinity over 2 or positive infinity. Now ready for the negative infinity. This is the left end behavior. Similar reason. A huge number squared plus 4. I don't care about the plus 4 anymore. So I'm looking at only the high power term in the numerator. And this reduces the exact same way here. What is the limit as x approaches negative infinity of x over 2. And I could do a constant multiple rule. And now I have a super easy limit. So this is negative infinity times a half, or just negative infinity. So we can draw our end behavior now. So right side is going to positive infinity, left side is going to negative infinity. Now I could have gotten a number out of this on a rational function if I had something like x to the third power in the denominator, my denominator would have overpowered the numerator and I would have gone to zero. So we saw this back in, I think, 3 point something, 3.6. We looked at end behavior carefully. So if you need to refresh, go back to 3.6 and look at the asymptotes and end behavior. So we found derivatives. That was step three. I'll just rewrite them here. So our regular g prime was x squared minus 4 over 2x squared. G double prime was 8 over x cubed, 4 over x cubed, no, 16 over 4, yeah, 4 over x cubed. Step 4, critical points. How do I find critical points? Yeah, so figure out where's the derivative 0 or where do we have a flat slope. How do I solve for x? Hey, I see x. Here's x in two places. What's a reasonable algebra move to make here? So fractions suck, multiply by the denominator. So it's just algebra 2, or algebra 1, somewhere in there. So multiply by 2x squared, we got 0 equals x squared minus 4. Now, I didn't have to worry about x being 0 if it was, that's already out of the domain. So that x value is going to give us a problem is already thrown out of the domain. So how do we f solve this here? Uh, 
could complete the square, you could factor, or you can go quadratic formula. Or you could add four to the other side, square root. There's four, four or five ways to do this. So plus minus two is what you get, which you can go x minus two, x plus two, You have to classify these also. So we have the two x values. Now we need to decide minimum, maximum, or inflection point. So plug them into g double prime of x. And this gives us concavity. So we're concave up, which means local minimum on our first x equals 2. How do I get the y value? Plug it into the original. So I need to know what is g of 2. So that's 2 squared plus 4 over 2 times 2, which is 8 fourths, and that's 2. So we had, so that was uh, for our local min, 2, 2. Now for our negative 2, that's a local maximum because we have a frowny face, concave down. And we're going to do the exact same thing to find the y value, except we're plugging in negative 2. And now we're going to look at increasing, decreasing intervals. And our g prime of x is x squared minus 4 over 2x squared. Now, rational inequalities were even more difficult than polynomial inequalities. Your first instinct might be to multiply by 2x squared. That's actually not a horrible idea. Can 2x squared be negative? So in this case, you get lucky. It can't be negative, so you don't have to worry about the inequality flipping. However, I'm still going to graph this to get the positive negative. Uh, or maybe we'll just do a sign graph. That'll probably be faster. So let's do a sign graph here. 